Fist pump. Fist. Fist pump. Okay, dear guests, today we invite you to the startup pitch taking place right here at 1220. I'm running it, so it'll be fun and high energy. The community is currently seeking coins and projects for profitable investments, and the startup pitch is the ideal place for this. Traditionally, at each forum, many, point, many coins of the participating projects skyrocket to the moon. And I'm confident, but though this is not investment advice, that today will not be an exception. And now I would like to thank our diamond sponsor, DJ Miner. DJ Miner offers Bitcoin and Dogecoin miners to over 80 countries worldwide. So they provide reliable hosting services. Please mo learn more about them at Booth D3. And our next speaker is actually a very long-term friend of mine, a, a real crypto OG uh, back from the US. Our next speaker will share his insights on the journey from idea to execution in the blockchain space. The discussion will cover key strategies for successfully launching a blockchain project, including funding, technology development, community building, and navigating regulatory landscapes. My favorite, of course. Please welcome the co-founder of Tether, Reef Collins. Big round of applause for Reef. Reef newly moving to Dubai, I might add. Energy, energy for Reef. Good to see you. How are you? Wonderful. Wonderful. I'm not going to sit this far here. away from you. I can't do that. Come What's up, buddy? In. How are you? Good, really happy to be here. It's a wonderful venue, lots of production value, great stage, and, and the, the show outside is really impressive. Is this your first blockchain life? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. great. It's, it's really taken off. It's a great show and it's a great crowd. I mean, look at this. Yeah. So before we get into the litany of questions, give us a little bit of background about you because I think people should know your pedigree, so yeah. to speak. Well, you know, it is, uh, I, I am most known for, for co-founding, being the CEO of Tether and, and creating the stable coin and launching it, but that uh, is definitely in the past. And since then, I've created many other companies that I'm very excited about. So it was amazing to bring the stable coin to life. And you have to rewind back to 2013 when nobody had ever heard of Bitcoin or blockchain and they had no idea the use cases that would be there. You got to think of the internet back in like, 93 or 4 when they'd go on the news and people would be like, oh, well, it's like like the radio on the computer. They didn't really know. Mm -hmm. And so when we had the concept of moving money like Bitcoin, they're like, well, what's Bitcoin and why would I want to move money like that? And so it's just been a, a real interesting transition. And now 10 years later, starting up more and more companies and, and this session is about what does it take to start a company in 2024? There are a number of things that have changed, especially in this industry, but overall it's having that vision, having an understanding of the landscape and a belief in it because you might feel like you understand the landscape, but nobody knows. You just have to have the optimism and the belief and to really, really go for it and follow what you feel is right. And here's the thing. You know, I've started about a dozen companies in my life, and especially early on, I had a lot of enthusiasm, and a lot of the ideas were terrible. And people older w would say, you know, this isn't a good idea, you can't go down that path. But I still say you need to forage ahead, mainly because even if it is a failure, because a lot of times those older people with more experience do have a lot of insight and are correct, but that's okay because you still need to learn for yourself. You still need to make a lot of those mistakes. You want to take as much advice as possible, but you also have to learn a lot of these, a lot of these lessons that only your personal experience can provide. So, so that's one of my things is just stay the course, have the vision, and, and, and really learn a lot of lessons along the way. And, and, and I think, I, I struggle with this, so I can relate to what you're saying. There, there's, sometimes there's naysayers, and you just need to armor your soul and proceed forward. But sometimes the naysayers are right and they can save you a lot of time. And I think the final call comes down to you one way or another. So you kind of have to be in tune with your soul and develop your own algorithm, which is a little bit in conflict with asking for advice. And, you know, you're, I think you're, you're getting a little philosophical, but I think your spirit is always developing and maybe you're getting more finer tuned over time. Absolutely. And it's discernment. Right? So it's what are those things nagging inside of you that you should pay attention to or that you shouldn't pay attention to? And that comes with experience and that's the discernment of, okay, this is the advice I want to take in, but this is the advice that, that I actually do know better. And at the end of the day, even if you're wrong, you do learn a lesson. 
So a, a lot of founders, especially serial founders, at some point say, okay, that was fun. Now really, now I want to kind of transition into the investor sit back LP role. But here you are in Dubai, still doing that OG founder stuff. What, what's your secret sauce? Well, for me, it's also every time you search for information or listen to people about why start up a company and what kind of company to start up, it's, it's what are you passionate about and what, what really turns you on and then focus on that. And for me, what I've found over the years, it's the inception, the concept, the ideation, like coming up with an idea and producing it. So I also, instead of being a founder, I also like to say I, I kind of produce companies because you have the idea, you bring in the team, you get the money, you put it together, and you birth it. It's similar to creating a movie. That's what the producer does. And so in this instance, I've kind of evolved now. I'm launching three companies um, that have kind of all been incubated and, and concepted here in Dubai. Um, so be, and the reason I'm doing that is because each idea is new, unique, and really compelling to me. Because after Tether, which was you know, the advent of the stablecoin, but it took a few years for the concept of stablecoin to even come out. And little did we know that it truly would become the foundation of the cryptocurrency ecosystem and enable all of these other companies to be built upon this foundation and deliver what we have today. And after that concept of, of creating a stable coin, the next idea was an NFT. So instead of a regulated token, because that was a lot of the issues with Tether in the early days and, and still to this day with all crypto companies, the concept was let's make highly programmable goods, or highly programmable tokens. And that company was called Block V. And it was yeah. also ahead of its time. It was the first company to ever really bring NFTs to the market, again, before the term NFT. And the idea there was, well, if it's a collectible, if it's a ticket, if it's identification, it's, it's this non-fungible token that's unique to you and has value. So we created this platform and did an ICO for that. And again, when we created that, people thought we were crazy. They're like, this doesn't make sense. Why would you, what, what does fungible even mean? What's a non-fungible token? Why do you need this stuff? But still to this day, and that company came out in 2016, we did the ICO in 2017. It took a number of years for us to, for the NFT boom to take off. And what was the first thing there? I say, Reeve, just out of curiosity, because I knew you then, was that ERC, um, was it 721 or 20? Was that yeah, th this was different than, than the actual standard. This was mm -hmm. creating the, the technology around the ability to create a, a, almost a micro app. Like, how do you program right. a token, a non-fungible token, that it acts like an app? Like, uh, a ticket, a programmable ticket, a ticket that comes alive. Like the gentleman that just came up here and talked about um, fan engagement, right? We've been ideating on fan engagement for many years. And so BlockV evolved into smart media technologies. And smart media technologies was just selected by Visa to be their global Web3 wallet provider. And the global, I mean, which was great, but the reason why it was interesting, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, the reason why it's really interesting for the fan engagement, we just did a big campaign at, um, at the Olympics. And so all the fan engagement revolves around these tokens. You'd get a token, it pops open, and it was the Olympic mascot, that little bird, and it would be gamified and you'd earn points. And now it's evolving into delivering on the promise of Web3. So, so let me ask you, because you said something interesting. You, know, you, the way, you haven't transitioned from, Sorry for not answering that question. <laughs> well, no, you answered right, but you led to another question, like every good answer does. The, you said you haven't surrendered the founder role to go to the opposite end, if you like, to the LP slash investor role. You've now become sort of a producer. We're talking about implementation. How, what, what is your experience with finding the team, and does the team, especially the executive level, do they share the same passion as you do if they're not the idea originator? Because usually the founder or the founder's team is the idea originator. I think in this case, you're the idea originator. You're the team former, but then someone else is, you're, not, you're yeah. not passing. You're kind of in an interesting middle position. How do you manage that? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And it's a mix because the, the basics of starting a company are, are, are the same as they have always been. Team, tech, you know, um, fundraising. <laughs> the, the real nuance in the crypto space is community. How do you really grow a big community? But also you have to have the idea, obviously. And where does the idea come from and how do you get that inspiration? And it either comes from you or it comes from 
which is typically the founder. So I do take a founder role. And right now I'm the founder, co-founder and chairman of uh, Treasury X, which is a new stablecoin infrastructure that's rolling out. Um, Super Solana, which is a Solana L2, and WeFi, which is a crypto neobank. But what do all these things have in common? And it was kind of playing off of where my last company, Smart Media Technology, left off, which is Web3. So why are we all here today? Because we believe in decentralization. We believe in blockchain. But more importantly, where is this all leading us to? We've been in this, or I've been in this for a decade. Hopefully you guys have been in this for a long time and some are new to this space. But you're attracted to this space because we know it is the future and it's the future of how the world's going to do business. And it's the future of how we're going to connect with people that didn't typically have the infrastructure to do that business. And this spans from financial services all the way to fan tokens. Like Paris team probably has fans all around the world that never had an opportunity to connect, to participate, to engage. But now they can acquire a fan token for $5 and feel like they're part of the team. So that's the promise of Web3, where the community is the ones that really get the value. Today, a lot of people say that Web3 companies, you know, it's, it's a company with a wallet or the, a token. Well, those are tools, but the real purpose of Web3 is to use that technology to ensure that your community, which is the most important part of a Web3 company, but to ensure your community is the one that receives the benefit, that reaps the rewards, because they're putting in the effort, they're providing your data, they're providing their time, and in the past, in the Web2 world, all they would get for that would be entertainment value, especially think of social media, et cetera. The social media companies make all the money, we get entertainment value. But in the Web3 world, with these tools, the wallet, the NFTs in the wallet, and I wanna do one quick aside about NFTs, a lot of people might think, oh, NFTs are dead, or oh, NFTs were a bunch of hype. Well, initially, it was, and why is that? Because what has led every big crypto bull run is speculation is gambling and the nft run-up was speculation and gambling on images and collectibles no one really cared if your ape was uglier than his ape all they cared about is if that ape went up in value and that's why they got involved and so once the speculation dies out the real use cases and the real value comes so i'm here to, to emphatically state that nfts are not dead nfts are an extremely important part of our digital life and our lives are becoming more and more digital so in the future these nfts are the building blocks of our digital life and these nfts or tokens are the things that will go into that wallet that's going to provide the community value so back to starting up companies in 2024 think about how do you get value to your community? And the types of companies you can start up now kind of go across the spectrum from deep infrastructure to like blockchain layer ones and layer twos. Actually, to, let, let me start you just because oh, I, I don't want to, I don't want to run down the clock and I, I want to get, I want to give the spotlight to your current startup. So I, I'd like you, uh, let me, I'll frame the question and then you can run with it. The, I think you mentioned you're involved in three startups right now. I'd like you to discuss them with an eye towards implementation challenges and opportunities so that our audience can kind of maybe analogize yeah, and get some absolutely. wisdom. Absolutely. So, so Treasury X, it's stablecoin infrastructure. It's a Web3 based stablecoin infrastructure, meaning the community is the one that's going to keep the yield. It's not a yield bearing stablecoin, but it's going to enable the community and institutions, those who mint the stablecoin, to get the yield and then they distribute it. So, it's essentially the infrastructure that Tether has, but enabling all of the profits to go to those who contribute the backing for that stablecoin, unlike what Tether and Circle and the centralized entities do. And so launching a company like that, it's the same. It's the team, the tech, the fundraising, the community. And so I have an extraordinary team uh, with very brilliant tech people building out this, this kind of cutting edge technology on how to, to keep everything in balance. Because what we do is we take tokenized RWAs and utilize them to both provide the yield and then the uh, backing of the stable coin. Um, and a big thing for, for founders is who are the backers and the VCs? So VCs do matter because especially if you're a first time founder, the amount of advice, because people talk about KOLs and advisors, your real KOL and advisor should be your VC. It's much more valuable than just someone that is a professional KOL or advisor. But if you do find 
someone that's not a VC that just wants to be an advisor, make sure they earn their keep because that's uh, been a racket in this business for, for a long time. Um, so that's Treasury X. WeFi, a crypto native neobank. Think about neobanks in the banking system. Again, it's the, the banks that make all the money, mainly because they oversee a lot of regulation, a lot of infrastructure to provide the services. But what happens when there's that level of cost? You can't provide the services to those who need it most, such as the underbanked and the unbanked. Sure. And so that's what Web3 and these crypto native banks have the ability to deliver. It's very cost efficient to service someone because all they need is an internet connection. And we can handle the KYC in these developing nations that don't quite have the infrastructure to do it. And that allows these people to be participate in the global financial ecosystem. And then the last one is called SuperSoul. It's a Solana L2. And we, when we talk about Solana L2s, everyone's like, well, Solana's entire pitch was we don't need an L2. And it is very scalable, Solana, and it's very cheap. However, it's not always reliable and it's not actually scalable enough for the use cases in the future. So SuperSoul is future-proofing Solana and it's bringing a lot of new use cases to the table for transactions that would typically be off-chain. So I was sharing with a VC just the other day, a good friend of mine, about this and he was like, why would you do a Solana L2? And then when I talked to him about it, he's like, oh, actually this is perfect. He was creating a new secure messaging app and he's like, we were looking for a blockchain or a solution or a side chain, like somehow to store all of this data and we didn't have one and we looked at Solana, we knew it just wouldn't work. He's like, but this could be a real solution because if you could have millions of transactions, instant and free, then a lot of things that used to be stored off-chain could be stored on-chain. So these are just some concepts of how Web3 can deliver value to the users and, and touching base on, on really what it takes to launch a startup in 2024. It's truly just the passion and the belief and the ability to go out and, you know, get kicked in the teeth a few times, but just stand up and make the company happen, so. Amazing, let's give a big round of applause for Reef. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well done. Thank you.